Recording started. Okay, hopefully this all works fine. At least in the past two years, I learned how to use Zoom. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Anand Bagmar and I work with Aptitudes. I work out of Pune. And uh, thanks to Swaroop and the team at Aptitudes, I've been on a long trip for two weeks going to multiple places and very happy to come back to Brisbane after eight years. I love the city more than Melbourne, Sydney, uh, for sure. I love it here. But um, today there are two topics that I'll be sharing uh, my experiences with. Uh, one is about flaky tests and second is about how do you automate real world scenarios. We'll make it valuable for you. We can spend as much time on either of the topics. We've got no restrictions. Any other topic as well, we could talk about that. I'm uh, absolutely fine on that. Quick uh, information, uh, background about myself. I've been in the testing space now for more than 20 years. I started with testing. Within the first year itself, I graduated to thinking about quality. And there's a big difference. Testing is what the testing team does. Quality is what everyone can contribute to. And that has been a huge transformational journey for me. Now, over the years, I contribute to Selenium, APM. I have other open source tools as well. But since about four and a half years, I've also been working with Tools as a solution architect and quality evangelist. That's what I do. Uh, one of the things is I connect with people like you, share experiences, and learn a lot from you as well. That's about me. So let's get started with the topic uh, for today. Before we start... Uh, I just want to understand the different roles that we play over here. Uh, who all is focused on automation or works on test automation? Okay. Manual and uh, okay. Uh, anyone focused only on manual right now? Okay, few. Uh, managers? Okay, developers? DevOps? Okay, so mostly testing focus uh, audience, that's great. So I want to start off by showing a few examples why there is a challenge and if you have also encountered these challenges in your experience, okay? To show this example, let's quickly understand the high-level architecture, the functionality, what is expected. So if you are testing an application which requires you to log in, get a list of users, and then you want to edit the user details, very simple functionality. Now, the way you would test it is you have some test data, you're going to log in using that data. When you log in, automatically a request goes to your application to get a list of users. From that list of users, you will be editing one of them, right? But when you make a request to get the list of users, actually the application is making a call somewhere outside in the world. It's making some API call to some other system. And this system could be in your organization as a different product set or it could be somewhere going out in the wild internet as well, right? But you get a list of users from outside and because it is coming from outside, you don't necessarily control what data set you get, correct? Because it's coming from an external system. Now, when you get that, you're going to say, okay, give me the first user or the, whichever user you want and you edit that user details and you verify everything is fine. The user details are actually getting updated over there, fair? verify the details. Now, in this case, let's see what might happen. I have the application running on my machine. Here's the application that is running. I just hit the application. I've already logged in, so I can, uh, get the list of users. I click on load more, it is going out to the internet and getting more users. That's the functionality of the application, right? That external call that is gonna happen. Now. If I have a simple test, a Selenium based test, which is going to automate this functionality, what would that look like? So if I say, this is a simple test, application is running on my machine. The test is going to run against that application. And this is where 
I need your help to keep the fingers crossed that the demo works. It was not working about 20 minutes ago. That's why I was sitting and trying to fix it. So the browser has launched. It is trying to connect to the application. Okay, login screen. Login. Login is done. It takes time to load because it's getting the data from the internet. It's going to click on that user and make some changes, edit, and then verify everything is fine. So the test worked fine. Okay. Now, let's see what else might happen over here. Now, as your application is changing, okay, your application is undergoing some changes or there's some change happening in the external application. Either way, you get a new build, you want to run the tests again, you deploy the, you know, make the changes, you deploy uh, you know, the application in that environment, you run the tests, starts off fine. Again, you get the login screen. Okay, that part is good. After logging in, and something weird is happening over here now. You're not able to get the list of users. Okay. And this is because the call is going out in the internet. Right now, I manually made a change uh, by pointing it to an invalid URL, but this could be something that you have experienced in the past, right? The external endpoint is either down, it is slow, it is getting redeployed for whatever reason. There could be various reasons uh, for why this API call would fail or why your test would fail because of that. And then if you run the test again, in most cases, it would work fine because now that API is back up, you're able to get that information, right? Have we encountered such situations in the past? Dependency on external systems causing our tests to fail or not just our test to fail, our application functionality not being testable. If we just had that data, we would have been able to proceed on proceed to test our application functionality, which is our scope of work, our scope of influence. But that's a problem, okay? So this is the first example I wanted to share. And this is one big reason of flaky tests. So if we come back to the slide, what happened over here is, this external endpoint was not available because of that our test failed. Why it failed? Because external service is either not available, getting redeployed, it is unpredictable behavior of that service. We don't control that environment. Or it could be because of dynamic responses, the API contract could have changed. There could be so many other reasons, right? Why it has happened. Or, or just a delay in response means our application is not behaving correctly because of that. So either case, this is a problem. Let's look at another example now. And for this, I will use a different demo. In this case, again, it's a Selenium Java test, but the application that I'm using is not on local. It's a already deployed application. And this test ran really fast because it's a shopping uh, cart type example where you open the shopping cart, you select a product, add it to cart, and uh, verify the product is added, right? Very quick test and that worked fine. But now, if I have to do the same thing against a new build, when developers deploy a new build, you want to ensure everything is fine. Now in this case, again, the same test starts, but it fails immediately. And for those who are doing automation, could you help me understand what does this error mean? It's a no such element exception. What does that mean? Sorry? Element is not visible on the page, right? Now, it's not in the DOM, it's not visible. It could be various reasons, this element not found. When the test wanted that uh, element, it is not available. Now, there could be various reasons. It is not yet available. Maybe the application is running slowly, our test is faster than the application. So it's not available by the time uh, we interact with it. Or the other possible cases, the locator has changed as well. 
the locator has changed, right? Uh, the way we are trying to access that element, that locator is not, uh, that access uh, methodology is not valid anymore. Have we come across that situation? Yeah. But the application functionality continues to work fine, right? If you go manually to the application, you'll be able to execute everything, make sure everything is fine. But our scripts depended, depends on certain locators and because that locator is not available, our functionality validation is failing. But the application is working fine. So why do we have to rely on locators when what we really care about is the user experience? Is the user able to really do things correctly, use the application correctly? Right? Now, this is a limitation of our automation approach in this case. This is not really a flaky test in that sense. Because a locator one change, it will not go back to the original locator again. Unless a developer realized this was an unintentional change, I revert back. If a locator has changed, it's there for a reason. Or the way the build is happening, the locators dynamically change as well. Have we encountered these issues? Yeah. Locator change based issues? Lots of times, right? It's like um, developers have created a framework, even a minor version change. And they, the actual output will look the same, but how it's built will be called fused different HTML. Exactly. So it can even be subtle changes, different versions of HTML, new features, and all of that. But it looks exactly the same. Yep. The developers haven't done anything because they're using a toolkit to, to generate the frame. Absolutely. So their, their interface is just a toolkit, not with the actual HTML that gets generated. Absolutely. So it causes heaps of issues. Yeah. And many projects actually have this challenge when the tech stack needs to change from a dev point of view, the UI dev no, tech stack. Functionality is expected to be the same. We expect the same user experience, same functionality to the users, but our automation is not usable at that point because the way exactly as you said, right? The way the DOM is generated is using a different set of libraries. They might be generating the locators in a completely different way. But automation is so uh, tightly coupled with that, it is impossible to really get a lot of value in that case, okay? But now, if I run this test in a slightly different way, in this case, you are not going to see the browser open up because I'm running the browser, uh, the test in a device farm uh, execution cloud, which is not on local. And in this case, what you will see is it's the same new build that we are speaking about, right? With change of locators uh, that is there. It's still the same. Uh, behavior that we would have expected, but with this execution cloud where the test is running, we are going to see that the test actually passes. Trust me, it passes, <laughs> okay? What is actually happening in this case, right? The test is running on the AppliTools execution cloud. And in this particular case, you are seeing I ran the test just a little while ago when I was fixing the demo. You see over here, the test has passed, but instead of just running one test, because earlier we ran it just in the Chrome browser on my machine, right? We saw the browser open up. Over here, we are seeing many different browsers and devices where the test has run automatically. And the test has passed as well. Here it is, the test has passed as well. What is happening over here is a completely different technology of how the tests are executing. This is using the execution cloud using visual AI. It has self-healing capabilities, which means even though the locators have changed, AppliTools is able to figure out, is there any other alternate locator that could have been used to interact with the same element and proceed with the execution. And you will see over here when it, uh, the magic wand icon is there, you will see what was the original locator and the new locator that was used for execution because of which the test passed. Okay. What does this mean? This test earlier, original test failed because the locator has changed and that could have changed for many different reasons. It doesn't matter. But this means our automation is not very reliable because of the tight coupling that happens. And if you think about it, what are the reasons of automation not being reliable? And especially if the tests keep on passing and failing indeterminately, these are called as flaky tests. You have no control over when it's going to pass, when it's going to fail, 
when it's going to pass again. You just keep praying and keep rerunning the test n number of times till it passes. And once it passes, you don't want to touch anything. Take that report, send it to your managers. Your work is done. Managers over here, right? How many times do we know about if the tests were flaky or not? Because the problem is if the test is flaky, it is going to cause an impact to someone or the other at some point in time. Just your report says, yes, everything is fine. Your end users at some point are going to encounter that issue. So test could be flaky for many different reasons. Do not automatically rerun the test or manually rerun the test just because it has failed and hope it passes. If it has failed, do the root cause analysis, dive down deep, figure out why did it fail and try to fix that root cause. Only then your product quality is going to get better. Okay. So there are many reasons of flakiness. We are going to focus on two of these aspects. One is how can we make the test pass or remove the external dependencies, which we have no control on and focus on our application quality, on validating our application quality. The second is about the locator changes and scaling of the execution. How can we get better at that? These are two things that we'll speak about. So welcome to the world of flakiness. It's not just about auto reruns and hope it passes. There are ways that you can actually address it as well. Okay. So with that, let's talk about how can we remove these flakiness. Let's dive deeper into these solutions. The first solution is the easiest of all. You have less tests, there's going to be less flakiness. You have less product code, you're going to have less bugs, right? But you need code to be written to get functionality. So you need to have tests to validate that as well. But do you really have the right type of tests automated at top of the pyramid? Can you move as many of those tests that need to be automated lower in the pyramid so you get faster feedback? If it is lower in the pyramid, that means it is not at the UI layer. If it's not at the UI layer, the chances of flakiness reduce drastically. And you get faster feedback. It is less, exp less expensive to run uh, write and run those tests at the lower layers of the pyramid. Also less red. In what way? Less red. So at the end of the day, uh, when we hand off whatever, whatever situation we are, um, people don't care. Right? The, the, obviously, the business owners that we hand off to, we only care if the application works so, Absolutely. So if you have a complex interface, then verifying every interface is not easy. So even though you have a lot of tests, you might have a very nice pyramid where you have heaps of tests at the bottom and you're all those you are um API tests and unit tests and all that stuff. But um if if you do have a complex say API, uh, complex interface, you might have to cover that with a lot of tests. You do. You're right. Uh so each and every test that you think is worthy of rep repetition. Yeah, people care. Yeah. In the end, they don't care about your tests. They don't care about your unit tests. They do care about just unit tests. Well, if you really think about it, no one cares about automation, right? What you care about is quality. Is your product quality working fine? The question is, how do you validate that quality is good? You can do that manually, but it's going to take a long time. How can you reduce that repetition and do faster releases? You have to automate. Now, each and every test that is important and worthy to be repeated multiple times, you should automate because it's a wastage of effort to repeat the same thing, right? The human mind is not getting challenged, is not really able to add that value that the mind possesses, that a tool cannot. But we end up repeating the same thing manually just because automation is not adding value in such cases, right? Of course, there are scenarios where because of complexity, the test might be not automatable or it is not valuable enough to put that effort to automate those scenarios. It's a very a specific set of cases which is manually or rather kept aside for manual testing as a conscious decision. But anything that needs to be repeated that can be automated, you should automate. My rule of thumb is any test that needs to be automated, start by thinking, can I get the same value of the intent of this test by automating at the lowest layer of the pyramid as a unit test? If that value cannot be obtained, then go a layer up. Maybe it's an API test or a component test. Can I get the value of, uh, can the intent of that test be validated 
by that API test. If not, then I go a layer up. And that way, uh, when the last point comes, okay, there is no other option but to automate at the UI layer as an end-to-end test, that's the right choice. Then whether you have one test or a thousand tests, it doesn't matter, but it's a conscious choice where to automate that, right? That's what I mean by saying, reduce the number of UI tests. Because UI tests are expensive to build, expensive to implement, very expensive to run. And any small change in the environment, in the execution in uh, flow, in the infrastructure, in the network layer, in the test data, there could be so many different parameters with multiple executions happening at the same time. It could impact the validation of that test. So that's why you want to reduce those as much as possible. Okay. So give a very conscious thought when you're doing UI automation, is it worthy to automate this at the top layer or can the same value be uh, obtained by automating at a lower layer of the pyramid? You don't want to compromise on the value for sure. Okay, So that's the easy part, but of course it needs a team buy-in and everyone else needs to contribute to automating at lower layers as, as well, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need an end-to-end -end test for that. You can have a UI component test to do that. Right? You don't need an end-to-end -end test for that. A UI component test means from the dev code on my local machine, just that component I'm going to spin up with appropriate data stubbed or mock. And I can test all the values in my dropdown, the click buttons and everything I can validate. I don't need the code to be deployed in the environment with test data available over there and then run the test against them. That is very expensive. UI component test can be done on your local machine. It can be done in a build pipeline itself for the UI repo. It's not a functional. It's not a functional. Just the Correct. Right. And if you have a lot of these validations done at UI component, then all you need to see is my scenarios, which are going to use these components anyway, but as a deployed environment, does that work well? That's where complementing effect happens of all your testing. Okay. And this is actually a big problem uh, when it comes to UI automation. We love writing code as automation engineers. I've been doing that for 20 plus years. Give me a test, I'll automate that, uh, regardless whether it's valuable or not. But my balding head and gray hair have started uh, to tell me that's not a good idea. Okay. Think about the value. How can you get the faster feedback for it? Okay. The next thing is about how can you um, use intelligent virtualization to eradicate external dependencies or to remove external dependencies. Complex words over here. Actually, the concept is very simple. Let's take an example. A typical example, uh, we all work on complex products, right? So this is a very uh, generalized way of looking at that architecture. You've got some front-end applications. For the consumer, uh, it could be B2B, B2C app. Uh, for onboarding, there might be different. For support, management, admin, uh, administration of your product, there might be a different way to interact. And when we talk about these as apps, it could be native apps or web apps, it doesn't matter. But there's some user interface which you're users are going to use their application and administrate the application. It comes through an authentication gateway of sorts. And then you've got a bunch of services or it could be a monolith, doesn't matter again. But you've got a bunch of implementations happening for providing the value that your product promises. It will also have a lot of different types of data stores and notification engines and so on uh, that might be their queues and topics. And typically, our products are not isolated. They work and integrate with different systems. The simplest of that could be your payment gateways, for example, right? You are integrating with an external payment gateway. And there could be many such uh, uh, other external systems that your product integrates with. This is very similar to the example that we saw earlier, login, get list of users, edit the user, a very simplified version of this complex application. Now what happens in this case is then we have to think about end-to-end -end testing, whether func uh, at a UI level or using API, you're doing orchestration to validate that functionality. What we do is we typically stub out or try to mimic what the end user is doing. This is what your test implementation is, right? 
you're going to simulate the end user behavior and uh, automate those scenarios by calling relevant APIs or making uh, interacting with your application uh, in the same way that the user will be doing only in form of automation. Now, in this case, if we take an example, again, similar to the earlier demo that we did, right? The test internally makes a call to service two, either from the app or directly as an API call. Service two does some processing. Based on the processing, it is going to call an external endpoint. The external endpoint may take a long time to respond or is not available, which means your service two is going to get an error response from the API call. It is going to return a response accordingly to the caller. In this case, that's the test, but the test was expecting a successful response. And it's of course the test is going to fail because the assertion is not as expected in that particular context. So the challenge over here is the external dependency, which is flaky, and we want to get rid of that. We don't care about that right now. There's a different problem with that, but we'll uh, talk about that later. So what we are going to do is, there are many uh, stubbing tools that are there. I'm going to talk about Specmatic, which is an open source tool, specmatic.in, if anyone is interested. We are going to stub out the external services using Specmatic. And the way we are going to do that is uh, that this is mainly designed for contract-driven development. But the way uh, this is going to work is all the external systems are stubbed out with this Specmatic running as a proxy server. Okay. This means in your deployed environment, in your automation environment, or in your test environment, you're going to set up Specmatic running as a stub server and all your endpoints, your services, which need to talk to the external endpoints, they are going to be routed to Specmatic instead. Okay. When that happens, you start Specmatic as a stub server. External services are stubbed out now because of this. Your internal services are pointing to Specmatic uh, stub server. Now, when your test is going to run, let's say my test is about uh, making a payment, okay? A successful payment scenario. The test intent is clear. I want to make, make an order, place an order, and the payment method uh, should be a successful scenario. So the test is going to tell Specmatic at runtime, what is the type of response that it should give when a request with a specific payload is reaching the proxy server, the Specmatic server. Okay. So now the test is going to start running. The test has already told Specmatic, the stub server, what response, uh, what request to expect and what response to give for that particular request. The test calls service to service to does whatever processing calls Specmatic as a stub server. Specmatic will say, let me check. Do I have a expectation setting done for me already? I've got this request. Has that been set in my memory? And if yes, what is the response I should give back? Because my test has already set a response over there, a request response over there, the stub server is going to respond with the data that my test has set for it. Now, service two gets the response. It does subsequent uh, follow-up processing and gives a response back to the test, which is saying, yes, it was a successful payment. There could be another test running in parallel or after this, which says, I want to uh, uh, simulate an insufficient balance scenario. So the test is going to say, if I get a request with whatever payload that is there, specific to the context of the test, I want you to give me a response saying there is insufficient balance. I don't have to change anything in my external endpoint to run this type of test. Typically, when we are doing payment related scenarios, we'll have a positive uh, data, which is going to give success response, or we'll give any random data, which is going to give in, uh, incorrect response. How do you simulate insufficient balance? How do you simulate timeout scenarios? Because it's a deployed environment. Because if you make a change to that endpoint, someone else is going to get into trouble or their tests are going to fail, right? Over here, we are talking about automation able to run all these scenarios without impacting anyone else. What it does need is a separate environment where the external endpoints are stubbed out.
the spectmatic server is just one you have got your test environment server is one it is going to take we've got two uh, 10 tests running in parallel each test is able to set this thing. so what you need to have for sure right if let's say i'm purchasing books if i get i want to run a successful scenario my test is about i'm placing an order for one book with isbn number and title author whatever right my payload has that information it makes it unique if you are running a test simulating a different scenario your isbn is going to be different your number of books could be different it's test data you manage to make it different so the payload requests are different it's like a hash map in very simplistic term what specmatic has a map right it's a unique key for which what is the response that it should give back so as long as your requests are unique you could be running this in parallel or n number of people could be running that test as long as the requests are unique the responses will be unique as well you can set it like that what you are saying is not fiddle that way you are going to be able to stub out the external services because in an integrated environment you will not be able to do that Absolutely. Absolutely. So what Specmatic does, right? If I go back a slide, Specmatic actually uh, supports the open API spec. You use any tool for API design, Swagger, Pact, anything, you will be able to expose or save that contract, API contract, as an open API specification. Specmatic uses that specification and it can do a lot of different things because it's mainly designed for contract driven development. One, it can actually just give an open API spec, it can do uh, contract tests for you, positive and negative scenarios, purely based on your spec itself based on the data types, uh, the rules that the API might have, it is automatically going to be able to generate positive and negative tests and run it for you. The next thing is when we are using it in this fashion, setting it up as a proxy server, you can give a predefined set of request responses as you correctly said, start it up with that. So it is going to give you those predefined responses for the request that you have already set up over there. That is like your static stubs which is again, standard stubbing tools will allow you to do that, right? Static stubs that are there. The big advantage that Specmatic gives us is ability to create dynamic stubs as well. If you have a request payload that does not match the static stubs, then you can set a different type of response that you expect. And if neither of the expectations are set as request responses, based on the contract that is there in the open API spec, it will give you a random response conforming to that schema. So it will you'll get the random responses as well. If static uh, stubs are not set. Hmm? All the steps already done by API mock server. So what is the advantage? Is like what is the benefit? Because the API mock server, we can set up similarly what you said based on what uh, like request you're passing, you can define the uh, positive response, like based on the request, how you want to respond, basically. Sure. Yeah. So, what do you like? so tools, a tool could be any. Specmatic is one way to achieve. That is the first thing. So, I'm not, Specmatic is not the solution. It is the solution that I'm using in this example over here. I just want to clarify that part uh, as one thing. The second thing is you use your open API spec and to stub out anything, the biggest challenge, the big risk of doing this approach that we are talking about, right? Uh, actually, it was ahead, sorry. The big risk of doing this approach when you're stubbing out a service, how do you keep your stub in sync with the actual endpoint? That is a big risk, in my opinion. So if you have an open API spec, any change that happens to the spec, you want to run tests against that and you want to check it for backward compatibility. That's the first thing. Using that spec, you want to build contract tests and, uh, sorry, the provider side tests and consumer side tests 
so that again you are able to decouple the development of producer and consumer out of it using the same spec that you have you want to set up your environment so that you'll be able to stub out intelligently for all different types of scenarios in parallel as well as long as that concept all these aspects can be taken care of use any tool it doesn't matter okay the thing that i have seen which not many tools have or rather maybe not any tool has is the ability for the test to set up a dynamic response in a deployed environment for a stub service that to me is a big differentiator if i want to test what if this external service gives a 500 response because that's what the contract says how is my service going to handle the 500 response and we are talking about external services we are not talking about internal services internal you are able to manage it in because it's in your control but in external service if i expect the if i want to test what's going to happen if i get a 404 or a 5xx error from my external service how is my service going to respond to that that is not possible easily in a deployed environment without actually making changes to that endpoint yeah. So let's look at uh, how this is going to happen. Okay. So this is my Selenium test. This is my Selenium test. The test is about login and update username. The first thing that I'm doing is I'm saying my stub server is already running. Okay. In that stub server, based on the context of this test, I want to set an expectation over there. What response I want when it gets a request. Okay. So I'm loading this expectation. I've got this uh, JSON file for the external endpoint that I'm stubbing out. It's uh, uh, payload. I'm loading that. In this case, I'm not really updating it to make it unique because this payload, I think, is fine. It's just a sample test. And I'm just going to call Specmatic and set that as an expectation with it. Now, you're talking about tokens, authentication, or anything, right? It's stubbed. Specmatic is not doing any processing. As long as the contract is valid, the payload has all the, no, the header has all the information, payload is exactly matching with the mandatory parameters and everything, it is just going to give a response back. The response could be based on what you have set from the test or what static stubs might, you might have set. Or if neither, it is going to give dynamic response based on the schema of that content. Right? So it is not doing any authentication or anything. That is simply going to respond based on what you have. So if you want to say it's token expired error, you could actually have a test which is going to do that. Regardless what value you send to it, it is going to give you the response that you want and your application, you'll be able to test that functionality, how it handles all those scenarios. Yeah. So in this particular case, right, if I have to run this test, again, Specmatic, we saw the test failed earlier. If I have to run the same test, I have Specmatic server also running over here. By the way, it's a simple jar file. I'm running it against that. Let me run the same test again. So now in this case, my external endpoint is stubbed out. I just changed uh, where it is pointing to my base URL, where it is pointing to, right? And it is going to be able to generate the response and uh, proceed from it. I've removed that dependency for external. So I could very well have been in a flight with no internet access and I could have tested this out on my own. No, it's not a substitute because if it was a substitute, then at some other point it would have failed because the token is invalid, for example, right? 
It is not a substitute. It is to say my focus is on testing my application. As long as the interactions with external systems are adhering to a contract, there are certain contract tests and all in place to safeguard. My stubbing approach is not in a completely different direction. It's always in line to the contract. I'll be able to proceed with this. This is not a substitution for integrated test, but it's the pyramid we are talking about, right? So the top of the pyramid, again, we are splitting up into two different parts in a way. A bigger base saying, I'm going to stub out external. I'm going to test maximum with external stubbed out. And then I have fewer tests at the top, end-to-end -end tests, which is actually going to go through the full integration path. But it's much more fewer tests, sir, the tests that you have now. And the flakiness reduces because of that. Now, again, it comes on to the point of are my external systems really stable or not? Do I have capability to manage all the test data that is required and simulate positive and negative cases of those responses? If you have, then you don't need this additional thing because this does mean you are setting up a different environment for running your tests as well. So there is added work. So depending on the challenges that you're facing, you need to see if this solution can help you or not. But anytime you are using stubbing for APIs, please make sure you've got API contract test to ensure your contract is always valid and you are stubbing based on the contract, not in isolation. Otherwise your tests will pass with stubs, but the minute you integrate, it's going to fall apart. That's a big risk of stubbing. Okay. So it depends how the framework is built. So I completely am with you on that. By default, you cannot just take a automated script and run it against different environments. Data dependencies is there. The flow of the test also changes slightly, right? Uh, based on that. So just this example that I showed over here, what we have in the test, I'm saying set expectations in Specmatic. If I have to run this against an integrated environment, this is going to fail. There is no Specmatic in that. So that means my framework needs to cater. It needs to allow running against different environments, which means this method, it should first check if it is running in a stubbed environment, only then make that call. Otherwise, it's a no-hop type of thing, right? You just return and uh, proceed from there. The data management needs to be externalized uh, because different environments have got different data, right? So the framework capabilities needs to be built to support that. It's not going to happen automatically. Mm -hmm. Correct. So based on that, you design your framework yeah. See, automation is just code. But you need to have a strategy for automation to make it successful for you. It's not magic. It's not a silver bullet. It's a bullet that will come to hurt you if you don't use it well. But it can help you a lot if you do it well as well. And the next part of the session, I'll talk about one approach that I have taken uh, for that. But we'll hold on to that thought for a little. I think it's very... Absolutely. Yeah. To run it faster, run it repeatedly. Right. Everyone is working agile. We want to get we get new builds very frequently. We want to make sure if we run the test against every new build, if there is a problem, we know which what is a delta change in that build. And we can focus on fixing it quickly. So it's all about that quick feedback. Okay. 
Any other thoughts on this approach for Specmatic? And as I said, it could be any tool. It doesn't matter. The key thing is make sure your contract is set and to use the same contract for provider and consumer side to do your development. Only then you should use that contract for stubbing out in your automation. If that is not happening, it's a huge, huge risk that your test will continue to pass, but the minute you integrate it is going to fail. Yeah. Okay. So this approach will allow you to simulate positive, negative edge cases as well without taking down the environment. That is a huge advantage because manual testing continues to happen. Uh, product owners, business analysts, uh, they continue using the environment to validate functionality, see uh, if everything is fine. You don't want to take down APIs just because you want to run the test. And you don't want to stay up late in the night when no one is using the environment to try out those scenarios as well. Right? So this is a great approach to allow you to proceed. Okay. So that same test, uh, I just ran it right uh, over here. The test passed just because I pointed it to Specmatic. It was stubbed. The test passed, even though that external endpoint is not there. I was able to simulate that kind of behavior and proceed. Also, this gives you a great control over the test data because external endpoints can give you different type of data. So how do you say the list of users edit Anand to make it something else? What if there is no Anand in that return list of uh, users, right? You don't want your test to fail because of that. So again, it gives you more control over your data as well that you can use for automation. Okay. So we saw this. Uh, so the flow in this particular test was we set up the expectations first and then we ran the same test. Then everything was uh, fine. The next thing that I want to speak about is the locator issue that we spoke earlier, right? We saw that demo. And we also saw in self-healing how the test worked. What does that really mean? So there are multiple concepts that I'll be talking about over here. Uh, and this is how Apply Tools again handles the situation and gives value to the teams. There might be different tools that does it similarly. Uh, not that I have come across, but there might be. I don't know everything. Okay. So we already know about the pyramid, all different types of automation that is happening. Our typical test that we have, uh, if we take the, again the Selenium Java example, we use Selenium as an automation tool to interact with the browser and get information from the browser. Likewise, you use any automation tool, that's what it will do. Interact with your application and get information from your application. And then you actually use assertion libraries to validate if things are working as per your expectation. If Anand logs in, then in the username, I should see Anand, I should not see Swaroop over there. That's an assertion that I'll write in the test, correct? So what happens is we write a lot of code to validate very specific functionality. We do all this automation that we saw in the earlier diagram about or the pyramids, but defects still escape to production. Okay. And the reason is we are not using automation effectively to really make value out of. Classic example is a locator change because of that, our test could have been absolutely spot on, but because of a locator change, we were not able to get value. And when it is a crunch time for the release, you have to do the release, whatever happens. You cannot wait for the automated scripts to be updated to run again to get that feedback. We still rely, unfortunately, on manual testing instead of, instead of risk-based exploratory testing. We uh, spend time repeating the same automated test, uh, checking it manually again. And defects are going to escape to production because of that, right? You are going to end up missing things. So why does that happen? It's because our approach has not really evolved. We are using better tool sets, technologies, but it is still a very stopgap arrangement in various ways when you think about it, how our approach to automation and our approach to testing is. And that approach is what I like to call as spot the difference. Have we played that puzzle, spot the difference? Yeah, when you're on the bus or uh, wherever, right? You're looking at two images and trying to spot what differences exist over there, okay? So let's play a small puzzle, okay? You all need to help out over here. I'll show you two images and tell me how many differences do you see in that, okay? You get five seconds, okay? Come on, we are testing in production. 
you have to make releases you cannot take half an hour for one image uh, over there right when will you finish everything okay ready clean your eyes if you need to i cannot tell you clean the tv it's pretty clean but okay here you go okay hold on sorry <laughs> it was not 5 seconds i'll start again i'll start again okay that is not how you play the puzzle yes that's how you play the puzzle but that's not fun right i'll show you the first image and i'll give you 10 seconds okay observe it that would have made it easier that's all you thought Okay, you're wasting time. Okay, time up, time up. Okay. Now here's the second image. For for those who didn't pay attention, you could say it's the same image I've shown, but no, it's not. Okay. Tell me how many differences you see. Wrong, wrong. Zero. One. Okay, we've at least got a big spectrum. Three. You can speak up three. It's fine. It's a wrong answer anyway. All the answers are wrong so far. Hundred twenty. Okay, that is also wrong. <laughs> okay. There are six differences that I have highlighted here, but there is a seventh difference which I also missed out uh, in the initial part. And I made this slide. There's one more difference, and now for those. keen eyed people if you spend time maybe you find many more as well okay why is this puzzle important what is relevant about this memory is one attention to detail memory these are important but how is it relevant to what we do i mean you compare your stuff with your automated test this is nothing to do with stubs mm-hmm. okay alignment color and all that's fine i think you're looking at very micro level details things change with time things change with time that's the nature of software as well right the problem over here is this is how we test to take it at a higher level abstract holistic point of view this is how we test this approach to spot the difference of having two different images if you have to do many of these you will start with the range of 0 to 120 i think that's the maximum number that was quoted <laughs> right but none of that is right uh, unfortunately this is a very mundane activity as a puzzle you would enjoy doing it but it's a very mundane activity if you have to repeat this as part of your testing work this is how testing happens unfortunately those who have been doing manual testing or contribute to manual testing is this how you actually do this how testing happens of course there's context but how do you know what is working on the screen what is seen on the screen is exactly what is the requirement you're using your muscle memory your brain power to think about what was the requirement what was the design what is the scenarios based on that you'll combine maybe one 10 different scenarios when you are testing the functionality but you are relying on your memory to what the requirement was that is exactly will spot the difference what we do in our testing work there is no difference it's not about automation you are right it's but it's not about automation right i'm talking about the approach itself to testing the approach itself to testing is about even if you take a new feature or a old feature you are thinking maybe you will go read the requirements again you'll read the specs you'll look at the wire frames and you're going to put that into context and saying this is a scenario i'm running is this exactly what is supposed to be like you're not going to compare it very rarely will you compare the design with actual what is happening to see if everything is spot on and if you have to keep repeating it n number of times you will not have that design open because you've seen that too many times but you are relying on your memory to see if everything is matching how many times have we missed things 
it's because it's a mundane activity because it is tedious you are always running against time you said 10 seconds that's too short all the managers here they are on our heads right when is this going to happen we have to make a release and that's a reason right business expects a release to happen at a certain time there are commitments made you need to complete the activities by that time and because of these running against time and constant repetition errors are going to happen you are going to miss out it's not intentional but you are going to miss out that is our approach to testing as well unfortunately okay and the products that we test, they're not static images, right? It's not opera house type of images. These are real images, which has got context. Uh, the data changes, responsive layouts are there, form factors changes things, user experience is there. We have experiments running in our products, AB experiments. And we suddenly see a different layout. Oh, this must be a different path that is executing. We ourselves give that answer. This must be a different path. Whether it's a defect or not, we may not really know about it unless we spend more time on it, right? So product has context. And with this context, if you're trying to do spot the difference, it is going to be problematic. If you have the luxury of time, if you love playing the spot the difference puzzle, day in, day out, for a long time, then that approach will work. But do you have time? You never have time. Agile has actually messed it up, right? Agile has messed it up. Microservices architecture has messed it up. That is still not the true Agile. True Agile is you make a change directly, it goes to production. You are doing iterative waterfall right now. In two weeks or three weeks sprints, you want to do a release. right? You will not be able to scale with this approach when there is manual activity required to validate certain things. And you'll see problems over here. What do you see as a problem over here on this screen? Sorry? There is no field over there. So what do you think is the actual issue over here? I can say that means the field colors are not there, right? But automation works fine. The fields are there. It is able to enter the text and it will proceed. These are things that automation cannot find easily. That's where the human mind is still very required. But now if the human mind is required just to see the colors and everything, is that true value of the human mind? Okay. In this case, the automated uh, automation works fine. It was able to click on the continue button. But there is overlapping content. Would you purchase a ticket if the website was like this? I would feel scared because I don't want to have an issue in my ticket where money has gone. My ticket is also probably incorrect. I have to go and talk to the airline people. It's a problem anywhere you go. It's a risk. What would happen in this case? Let me go to some another website and I'll try to book the ticket from there. So what has happened for this website? It has lost its business and reputation as well. We are in a world of Instagram, Twitter, threads and whatever else. Immediately, we'll take a screenshot, we'll post it somewhere. Right? It's a challenge. It's a genuine challenge. And you'll see these problems all over the place. This is Jetstar website from last year uh, when I was coming. You see, it's the layout is completely broken over here. It's very unusable. I don't know what flex ticket really means over here. And for $5 more, I could have done that, but I don't know what's going to happen. Most recent, uh, this is one and a half week ago. Important. Yeah, the Qantas website. How will I get access to it otherwise? <laughs> and the problem over here, the problem over here was the website was slow from where I was accessing. This was an Australian website, right? Not the India website. I was booking a ticket from there. So yes, there was a performance issue. It took time. But you see the null over here? <laughs> that to me is a problem, uh, more of a problem than the screen being empty right now. Mm -hmm. Null means there was some default empty text that is coming up over there. After some time the site loaded correctly, I was able to purchase, I was able to travel. Actually, I hope I'll be able to travel tomorrow. I was booking the next ticket, Brisbane, Sydney. So I'll let you know tomorrow if this worked fine or not. Okay. But this, these are genuine problems, right? And this, you cannot really 
justify by manual testing. Automation would have failed here if it had the specific timing issues. But if you are uh, if you love thread dot sleep, then this issue would not have come up again. Okay. Now this null I was able to find because I was manually looking at it. Automation would not have been able to find that because automation would be saying wait for some text over here and then click on it. Automation would not not be saying oh this uh, shopping car the cart should be zero and over here there should be some other button that shows up. Automation is focused on very specific areas and that's a problem. So how do we proceed from here, right? I hope you understand the challenges that exist here. It's not just for automation. It's a challenge for manual testing as well. Repetition is a problem and you have to repeat it on each and every browser, each and every device, different breakpoints that are there. And you need to do it for every release. Even if you say every sprint, it's still not easy to repeat that every sprint because the scale is too much. So what do we do? This is where computer vision can help a lot. Okay. Now I did this other set of webinars with chat GPT and the impact of chat GPT in automation. There's a Gartner report over there uh, that I speak about, which talks about the hypes of AI. And in that hype, uh, it has a, a very interesting graph. If anyone is interested, you can look at that webinar, or ask me, uh, uh, message me, I'll send the link to that. There is a stage of where the technology is becoming acceptable or mature enough for use. Any technology, any advancement that happens, it goes through early adopters uh, or other experiments, early adopters, uh, major adopters, and so on, right? And the technology also stabilizes accordingly. Computer vision, chatbots, autonomous driving, these three things are at a stage of realization where it is becoming very easily available and reliable for the end users. It's three things that are there. Autonomous driving, which we know of examples of autonomous driving happening in certain parts of the world. Uh, chatbots, we know it's very difficult to talk to some uh, 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 bot, um, rather chat uh, assistant and I always rack my brain because it is not able to give me the answers or solutions that I'm looking for because it's a bot responding. Uh, it's a challenge, but it is getting way better. It's difficult to predict what really is going on over there. In many cases, it is very helpful as well. I don't need a person to really uh, be there to respond to those queries in many cases. And computer vision is something which is uh, there as a uh, state of realization where it can add value. And that is where visual AI also fits in. So that report I saw earlier uh, this year, but visual AI, uh, invented, created by AptiTools eight years ago, right now, 2015. AptiTools was formed in 2015. And visual AI started off from AptiTools at that point in time. And the level of maturity it has uh, reached, it coincides with the Gartner report as well. And what does that mean? Typically, when you think about doing visual comparison, spot the difference, you're looking at two images and trying to compare them. In terms of automation, what that means, in the original sense, it was about doing pixel comparison. Does my image on the left, uh, is it identical to the image on the right? But we know pixel comparison doesn't work. Why? Because we're not comparing two photographs. We're comparing two products. Today, the date is 24th. Tomorrow, it is 25th. If I try to compare these having a date timestamp, it is going to give me false positives saying here's a difference found. Product has context and pixel comparisons will never work for that. What AI can do is it can help you focus on differences that actually matter. There are different tools, uh, algorithms that can be used in context of your application to give you the best possible validation out of. And remember, AI, whatever tool sets you use, should support all platforms that your application is available on. If you have web, mobile web, Android app, iOS app, the tool set should be able to support that. It's okay if it doesn't, but you need the right tool for all that, right? For, for all the platforms to give you the right type of value. AppliTools AI works actually with all browsers, all types of native apps, uh, desktop apps, and PDF documents as well, and images as well. And you can use AI algorithm out of the box to start testing it. Even today, you can start off directly. There's no training of the algorithms required for that. Okay. Now, what that means is, right, with your product quality, whatever automation you are doing, you're going to add a layer of user experience validation on top of that as part of your automation. So all those screenshots that we saw earlier as examples, 
Southwest and the banking website, Jetstar, Qantas, and all those, any type of product, you'll be able to add visual validation on top of that, which tests your functionality and your user experience automatically. Now, if I ask you how many pillars are there in this office, what would you do? You will have to go around and count them, right? You might miss out if you don't know the layout of this office. Like I've come here first time. I might miss out on some room where there is a pillar. I don't know. But what a tool can tell you, if you look at the blueprint uh, or a plan of this, it can tell you immediately, okay, there are so many pillars. So what AI can do for you, visual AI rather can do for you is you look at two images based on your choice of algorithms, the tool will tell you here are all the differences that are there. What is expected, what is not expected, only you as a team member know about it. No one else can tell you. No tool can tell you if this is wrong, this is unexpected or not. But the tool can tell you, this is what you expected as your design. This is what I see right now. Here are the differences. Now you take a decision, what is it? Okay. So now what that means, right, is if I go to the Applitools dashboard, I'll show you very quickly how uh, this works. Let's take simple example. I'll start with a passing case. So Apple Tools is telling with the choice of algorithm, if there is no difference, it is telling you it is passed. But if there is any difference, it is showing it as unresolved. Let's start with a passing example. Left side is the baseline, the golden copy, your design, your approved state of application for this particular test when the test ran. As another persona or something else, this same page might look different because the context of that test is different. Okay. But in context of this particular test, when the test ran, left side is the baseline and the screenshot that was captured as part of the test is on the right. And that is being compared. Now you don't need any tool over here to say that these two images are different. Left and right images are different. Correct. Data is completely different. You don't need any tool to tell you that. But yet Aptitools is marking this as past. Why is that? Because it used the AI algorithm called layout, which says, I don't care about the data. Is the structure of my page as expected? Because I don't have control over the data maybe, right? So I want to make sure the structure of my page is not broken for any type of data that comes in. With that aspect, the test is passed. Exactly. Okay. Correct. But now, if you have to do this as a pixel matching, I change the algorithm to exact. At pixel matching level, everything, including the header, the logo, or uh, top right corner, everything is marked as different. Because even a single pixel difference in the rendering causes a pixel matching to say, okay, there's a difference found. Now, some tools provide tolerance levels, setting the tolerance level. But how do you say tolerance of X percent is okay and Y is not? In that X also, you might end up with misses or false positives. There's no real logic behind saying what percentage tolerance is okay or not. Pixel matching is very risky. It doesn't give you a lot of uh, any value for that matter. But maybe you say my logo, my brand image, right? It always has to be pixel perfect. There's a use case for that, right? Of course. So my logo has to be pixel perfect. But my header, it's a static header. I don't want pixel matching for that. I don't care if it moves a, pic a few pixels here or there. But the content should be the same because it's static. Any change uh, which is unexpected, I need to know about it. So what I could do is, in this case, I'm going to mark the header as a strict region. The strict is uh, algorithm which is a, the most powerful AI algorithm we have, it says anything that is different to the human eyes, show that as a difference to me. It is not pixel matching. As humans, whatever we perceive as a difference, I want to know about that. In this case, because I chose the static header as strict, there is no pink region inside because everything seems fine. I can toggle between the baseline and the screenshot also and see that, okay, yeah, that small pixel difference. I don't care about that is okay. It's acceptable to me. Right now I know my content is always going to be dynamic. I don't have control over that. So let me mark that as a layout. When I mark that as a layout, you see the pink region has disappeared from it again. 
there might be certain ads that show up or videos that play in your application, right? Uh, you cannot do uh, visual uh, validation for that. Ads also by nature, you don't know which ad will show up if at all or not. You don't know that. You want to just ignore that. So you could say, I want to ignore this part. So now I've been able to uh, ignore certain parts of comparison. Now with a combination of these four algorithms, I'm able to get the validation that my brand logo has moved and that is a problem. Okay. So the choice of algorithm is in your hands because you understand your application best and you can choose based on the context of your test, which environment you are running the test in, what is under your control or not, and you can do the best possible validation that way. Okay. I'll show you another example over here. Let's take a mobile app. In this case, again, data is dynamic. You see the highlighted differences. They all seem to be data related, right? Now, because the data is dynamic, now I'm going to say, okay, let me use this as a layout algorithm because I cannot control the data that comes in over here. But strict, I want to use as a base because that's the most powerful one, right? I'll select selectively use layout for the other parts. Now you see the pink region has disappeared. Not disappeared, actually it has reduced because there is still one aspect that is highlighted over here. And that is in this green label has got a highlight. There is data missing over here. So the AI algorithm is able to figure out difference of data as compared to difference of structure. And that is very powerful. Now this issue, if you dig deeper, it could be because of two potential reasons. One, there is a problem in your APK, in your app itself. Some rendering logic issue is there. In some cases, the data is not showing up or maybe the first label is not getting the data. Could be any reason based on your investigation, you will be able to find that. The other problem could be, it could be in your API, which is getting the data. Maybe there's a problem in the API itself. Regardless of the issue, your visual test has been able to highlight and find a functional issue. This is not just about a UI issue. This is a functional issue. So with visual AI, you are able to test functionality and visual validation. At the same time, we are now doing one screen validation, rather one validation for the full screen. Your test could be about you come to the Yahoo Finance, click on the hamburger icon, do something else. You're not even doing any validations here. Maybe there's another test which says basic should be selected by default. Or I want to click on details and see something else. You're going to have n number of tests based on the same set of screens. Instead of that, if you optimize your scenario identification and use visual validation, the number of scenarios reduce, but you are able to do a full screen validation. You are able to validate full functionality of that screen, even though it might not be directly related to your test. So you're getting increased coverage by automating less tests, fewer tests, and you're getting more value as well. Absolutely. Now what happens, right? I run uh, in this particular case, I have nine tests that I've run over here. I need to come to this dashboard only to take decision on the unresolved tests. If it has passed, I don't need to worry about it. I will come here, take a decision on the unresolved test. And how am I going to take a decision? I look at it and say, oh, over here, there seems to be this other problem that is there. But this is not really a problem. My product functionality has evolved. Going forward, this is how it is going to be. All I need to do is do a thumbs up. When I do a thumbs up, I see that this test is now marked as passed. However, if I see, uh, I'll take another example. This seems to be a defect for whatever reason. Now, if I have a defect management tool integrated, I will create a defect over here, give it some name. This is a bad name, but I'll create a defect with the defect management tool integration. You can actually create a defect directly in the tool. And at that point, you're going to do a thumbs down. When you do a thumbs down, this has now been marked as failed. So Applitools doesn't tell you what is wrong. It tells you what is different. Based on what is different, you decide, is this a evolved functionality or is this a defect? Because only as a team member, you will be able to take that decision. All the popular ones, which one do you use? Which ALM? 
No, yeah, HP ALM. Yeah, we integrate with micro focus also. Should be with all this kind of popular. Correct. Okay. Yeah. When you are implementing the test, you will decide what algorithm is right for this. Okay. So As an implementer, you would need to say, I this is the context of my test. What should I auto uh, which algorithms or combination of algorithms? should I use for it? Or a combination, right? As I showed on that Yahoo Finance screen uh, or the earlier one as well. You can choose whichever combination that makes sense. If you say that earlier you were talking about dropdown, right? I just want to validate if my dropdown has the content over there because there was some heavy processing that happens. I just want to make sure my dropdown content is visible. Click on the dropdown and then do a visual validation only of the dropdown instead of the full screen. It is possible. So, no, uh, there are multiple ways. The demo I'm showing is on a public cloud, which is in the US, but customers can also choose to use a dedicated cloud in the region, wherever they are. So we have Australia cloud as well, Azure, that could be used. In some specific cases, if you don't want to use a cloud solution, like government organizations sometimes have that, you could also have an on-premise installation. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we still got plenty of time. So, do you, do you want to continue or do you feel like you have more? Hey, wait, no, five minutes more. I'll just wrap up this section. Then we could take a pause we'll, and then come we'll back. To about 10, 10 yeah. Minutes. yeah. So we'll just, uh, I'll conclude this uh, part uh, that is there. So this is one part of the visual AI. The second thing that we saw when we ran the tests is about the scaling. Remember the test ran on the local browser, only one browser, but we see seven different browsers, uh, test for seven different browsers, right? If I look at that, how did that happen? The test actually runs once, but whenever you do visual validations, if you have the ultra fast grid integrated of aptitudes, you can specify the number of browsers and devices where you want the validation to happen. So automatically you'll be able to get the results of all of those. What this means is a typical cross browser testing strategy. I've got 100 tests. I'm going to run it on my four major browsers and uh, three or four devices, portrait, landscape, or tablet, uh, phone, whatever. Essentially, 100 tests multiplied by the number of combinations that we have, right? Seven, eight, or whatever it might be. If 100 tests take one hour to execute, seven combinations is going to take seven hours minimum to execute. That is going to have flakiness, infrastructure cost, test data in our requirements, load on your test environment, lot of other challenges that you need to look at. Instead with the ultra fast grid, you are running the test only on one browser. So only 100 tests are going to run. And you could run it in parallel as well, right? To get faster feedback. But 100 tests, the feedback you will get for seven combinations or n number of combinations that you want in a fraction of time more. So if I have to give these seven combinations as an example, 100 tests took one hour, 700 results will come back in in one hour, five minutes, one hour, 10 minutes. That is that kind of scale and speed that you'll be able to get with the ultra fast grid. Okay. And it's a very easy thing for you to specify that because all you say is in the configuration, you just specify what are the different browsers and viewport sizes and devices that you want where the rendering should happen. This is in your configuration itself. Now in the test, whenever you say eyes dot check window, check window is going to do a full screen validation for you by default. Uh, it can also do a scroll and take full page screenshots or only what is there on the viewport. And there are different uh, methods that we have. I don't uh, have the example over here, but you can use a combination of algorithms from it. But anytime you tell Apply Tools to do the validation, automatically the same screen validation will be done by all the browsers. 
without needing new test data or load on your environment or anything. It uses the latest uh, browsers and you also get last two versions for each of those browsers. And we keep on updating the browsers in the grid for that. Okay? Exactly, exactly. And that's what is actually different, right? Because browsers are W3C compliant. So if functionality works in one, it will work in all the others. Unless you are building browser specific components, which I'm hoping no one does that anymore. Right, because it's not valuable. It doesn't. It's not required. So, if functionality works on one, it is going to work on all. What is different is each browser has its own different rendering engine. You want to make sure rendering is happening correctly in all. That's where this combination works. It's. It is actually just rendering the same screen. It's taking a snapshot of the screen, and re-rendering it in another browser. It is not doing functional loading of that environment, re-rendering of the screen. DOM and CSS and images, uh, all of that is captured and read. Okay. The third thing that is happening, which is uh, in a way magical, is the self-healing capabilities. Because you run it in the AptiTools execution cloud, if the locators have changed, of course, this means the first time the test should have run successfully for AptiTools to know and capture different locators for the elements that are there. But the next time you run the test, and if that locator that you're trying to interact with is not there, it will try to find a different matching one. If it is able to find, it will use that. You get a notification over here saying a different locator was used and the test has proceeded successfully. There could be cases where the test has not uh, worked correctly. Okay, so this is an example, right? Using self-healing, the test proceeded but there was still a difference in one of the browsers. You look at it, this seems to be a pure visual issue where the rendering is different over here, only in that one combination. Other combinations, it was fine. And if you have the root cause analysis enabled, you click on the difference, you'll see the DOM and CSS difference, which caused this rendering issue to happen. So now your UI developer can take this and fix the problem uh, quickly. Okay, so with self-healing, the test runs, yeah. JavaScript layer is bypassed. That is correct. So we've got different techniques that can be used for JavaScript, but JavaScript execution doesn't happen in the ultra fast grid. So a typical challenge that uh, where we see uh, because of this is your responsive design is controlled by JavaScript instead of CSS. In that case, we recommend a slightly different execution strategy where you'll be able to capture different viewports uh, for uh, as separate runs and then run those viewport combinations in the ultra fast grid. But JavaScript execution is a challenge. Okay. So with the execution cloud, you are able to run it in the cloud. You don't even need to have your machine occupied. Trigger the test on your machine or in CI, the test is going to run. You get self-healing, you get ultra fast grid to scale as well. So your stability increases execution speed increases and your machine is still usable when the test is running. No. AI, no, no, we internally take care of that. Okay. Now I'm a big skeptic of self-healing by the way. Why? Because I'll tell you the reason why, right? The locator might have changed. I find an alternate locator and functionality is able to proceed. What if that element has moved in a different location altogether? So before the execution cloud, I was a big skeptic of this. With the execution cloud, self-healing is there, but you're also doing visual validation. So with visual validation, you will know if location has changed, color has changed, any change has happened as per the baseline, functionality is able to proceed, but I know there is a, a problem and I'm not going to miss that out. No, it happens together, right? In tandem. All you need to say is in my execution, my scenario has got five steps in the workflow. I'm going to take five validations as part of that, right? 
and it's going to have self healing along with it. For self healing, first time the test has to run, uh, you know, for aptitudes to know about the different locators that are possible. Test out, yeah. 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 So, date of birth from the date. No, it's not like that. This is based on your DOM, your application. This is not doing image recognition. This is a lot of other type of learning is happening, which is internal knowledge, even I'm not aware of a lot of the internal That's implementation. Right. It's not based on the uh, UI finding out a cart icon and using that, right? What if I'm using custom images? Uh, uh, that is going to become tricky. In that. So this is different. Okay. Now with this approach, you run the test once, the, it uses a different locator. Next time it might find a different locator to use as self-healing and proceed as well. You don't really care because now you're decoupled from the locators. Only locators you need is to do the interaction and navigate your application to achieve the functionality. All other locators you don't really care about as long as your experience is the same. No, it's it's a standard Selenium driver. When you do uh, start eyes, so when you start the test, you will tell Apply Tools a new test is beginning, and you're giving the driver to it. So in this case, I'm giving a Selenium driver to Apply Tools. So here's a driver and some other information for it to use. No, it's the same driver. So you are still using Selenium to do the navigation. Any validations, you're going to use Apply Tools eyes for. So use your automation tool to do the navigation, do the interactions. Validations are done using AppliTools Visual. It gets faster. It gets faster because first of all, your machine is not blocked, right? The test is triggered from your machine, but execution is happening in the grid over there. Of course, what that means is it is going to need access to your application from the execution cloud. Okay. But because execution and validation is happening in the cloud, it is much more faster. And you're not running it N number of times because of cross browser strategy as well. Okay. So, yeah. There's always a chance, but that's where Tying it with the visual validation is very important. Without that, it would have clicked on something and the test procedure is going to fail at some other point because it clicked on something else that was unintended or the location has changed somewhere else. So it's a different problem that you have missed out. With visual validation, you are able to get uh, that safety net self-healing plus visually everything is fine as well. Of course, of course. There is no configuration. You use the algorithms uh, based on the context of your application. If it doesn't find it, then it's going to fail with no such element. It has to be a reliable find only then it will use it. No, it's like any you know, the typical strategy for self-healing, right? Now, what are the thought process about saying what's an alternate locator for what you are looking at? Only if there's a reasonable level of uh, guarantee that it's the same locator, then it will use. So I'm quickly going to summarize this. We'll continue the conversation during break as well. Uh, I know the you know, pizza is getting cold probably, but you need to make your automation intelligent. Okay. Reduce the number of UI tests and by reduction, it's not to reduce the value of your automation, but genuinely think can a lower layer Automated tests give us same value or better value to you. Reduce the number of UI tests. Then what you have at the top layer is going to add value to you. It's not just increasing the execution time. You have to think about intelligent virtualization. Intelligent is important, not the static stubs. Because static, the static stubs have a limitation of how much can really be done over there. The key thing over there is, of course, to use the same contract what you're using for stub to run the contract test. 
Otherwise, your test can be decoupled from the actual implementation. And using visual assertions instead of functional assertions, along with self-feeling and ultra-fast grid, can give you scale, increased coverage by writing less tests. And less tests means it has less flakiness as well. And you're going to get wider coverage in faster time. Okay. So that's what, uh, these are some of the techniques that you could use to reduce flakiness and get wider coverage of your application. So with that, let's pause. Of course, we'll continue the conversation, but. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so just before we have our discussion. Um, just please uh, introduce yourself. Um, this is the, 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 